Amen. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in online. We're glad that you're watching on television and around the world. God is good. All the time, God is good. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord, everybody. I got a word from the Lord tonight. I pray that I'll be able to speak and minister to your spirit and encourage you. I believe the body of Christ needs a spiritual awakening. I believe all around the world we need to see people come into a spiritual awakening. I believe sometimes we've got it all confused. It's not our kingdom. It's his kingdom. Come on, he's not here to serve us. We are here to serve him. Come on, somebody. We're not, we're not called into his kingdom for our purpose. We're called into his kingdom for his purpose. Look at somebody tell him it's not about you. Come on, it's not about you. If you have your Bibles, go with me to Psalm 24 and verse number 1. Psalm 24, verse number 1. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. The world and all those who dwell therein. The earth is the Lord's and its fullness. It's all about him. It's not about you and me. It's not about us trying to get our needs met. He promised us he would supply all of your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And somehow we've become a bunch of wimpy Christians that are always trying to get God to minister to us. We're not here for God to minister to us. We are here to minister to him. God's not here for our purpose. We are here for his purpose. You will all, you'd be surprised how many people come up to me and say, Pastor Greg, I need to find my purpose. How do I know my purpose and what is my purpose? I'm here to tell you, you will never fully understand your purpose until you understand his purpose. And when you begin to understand his purpose, you will naturally flow into your purpose. For this purpose was the Son of Man manifest, that he might, what? Destroy the works of the devil. We are here to take his territory back. We are here to take territory. I want to continue in what I was talking about in the first service. I want to continue talking about taking the territory. We have been so blessed, and we have so many great leaders that were leaders of the nations of the earth, so many great evangelists and pastors and teachers. We have had the privilege, and I was introduced to David Livingston. Pastor Andre said, you need to study the history of South Africa, and you need to read about David Livingston and how he brought Christianity into South Africa, and he brought it to Africa. Our, our, our world has been blessed with so many great leaders, Howard Carter and Dr. Lester Summerall, an evangelist and a teacher who traveled the world and taught people and preached to people about repentance and revival. I'm so blessed. I was one of the last people on the planet to be ordained into the ministry by Dr. Lester Summerall, who laid hands on me and commissioned me to preach the gospel. We've had so many great leaders, Howard Carter, Dr. Summerall, Oral Roberts, the faith movement, Catherine Kuhlman. I have a man at my church preaching for me while I'm here. He is, his name is uh, Bill Prankard. He was in a Catherine Kuhlman meeting and got an anointing from Catherine Kuhlman. On the way home, he was riding in a bus full of people, and he asked the people, how many of you did not get healed tonight? And almost the entire bus lifted their hands that they had not received healing. And that anointing from Catherine Kuhlman was over his life. And he said, pull the bus over. And he laid hands on everybody in the bus, and everybody on the bus got healed. And now he's been commissioned to Canada. And Bill preaches from sea to sea, Canada shall be saved. We've had so many great leaders in Billy Graham. You're talking about a, a year of abundant harvest, and look at the souls that were saved under Billy Graham's meetings. You go to Amy Simple McPherson, a Smith Wigglesworth. I mean, just through history, so many great leaders. Charles Finney. I got, I got to be real honest with you. Like, I'm, I, 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 I'm looking for anointings. I'm looking for mantles. I talked to you this, this in the first service. I talked to you about the bones of Elijah. Who, when they threw the, 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 the thief, the, 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 the man that was killed by the band of raiders, and when he hit the bones of Elijah, he came alive. I mean, it's been in my nature. I lived in Cleveland, Ohio, in the United States, not nearly 20 minutes from where we live. 
is buried, a man named Charles Finney. Charles Finney was a revivalist that carried revival all over the world. When I found out Charles Finney was buried no more than 30 minutes from our house, I, I said, I got a map. I got to figure out where was this man buried. And I found it. I, I, I had to hunt through a cemetery and found a little rock, and it said, here lies the, here, here lies the body of Charles Finney. I'm telling you, I laid down on that ground. I dug my nails into that sand. I said, God, if there's a mantle from Charles Finney, let it fall upon me. I had a lady dying of cancer, and they, they, they took her to Zion, uh, Chicago, near Chicago, Zion. And, and I, I went there to pray with her. And when I got there, they said, this is the place where Dowie, this is the place where Dowie was an evangelist. And Dowie preached here and had revival here. And they said, he's buried not too far from here. I said, can you take me to his grave? And they drove me, and I found Dowie's grave, and I lay, it was snowing. It was cold, and I laid down on that ground, and I dug my hands into that ground. I said, God, if there's a bones of, of, of Charles, of, of Dowie are here, if there's a mantle for revival, let it fall on me. It wasn't too long ago, we were at a Kenneth Copeland meeting. And Kenneth Copeland was preaching, and I looked over my shoulder, and, 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 and Pastor Andre was sitting in a seat. We hadn't met very much. He's been to the church a few times then, and I didn't know him very well, but I was so excited I wanted to meet him. And immediately he got a phone call and had to step out of the meeting. And when he stepped out of the meeting, I went over and I step up now. I went over and I sat down in his seat and I said, God, if there's a mantle of revival on, on Pastor Andre, let it fall on me. I've been looking for I've been looking for the spirit of the living God that would move upon a nation, would move upon a people, that God would call us to revival, that the power of the Holy Spirit would sweep through our land, and in the last days, God. God would pour his spirit out on all flesh and sons and daughters will prophesy. What I'm trying to tell you is I'm hungry for the mantle of the Holy Spirit. I'm not looking for it from a man. I'm looking for the Father to pour his spirit out. And I want to talk to a people that are hungry for God. Hallelujah. I want you to think about it. I want you to think about it. We are the revivalists of the day. We're not looking for some new leader to pop on the scene. It is you and I. He said, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. We are living in the last days when the fire of God is being released and you and I can carry the fire wherever we go. Jesus demonstrated the power that was available to all believers. Paul wrote about it and demonstrated it. In 2 Corinthians 4, 1 says, Therefore, since we have this ministry, we have received mercy. We do not lose heart. Paul was telling us, you have a ministry. I have a ministry. Go to Luke 9 and 1. Jesus said exactly what our ministry is. Luke 9 and 1, then he called his 12 disciples together. And he gave them power and authority over all demons to cure all diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. We need a spiritual awakening in the nations. We need to get the word out. We are here for his purpose. We are here to destroy the works of the devil. We are here to take territory. In Mark 16, 15, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's what we're doing in television right now. That's what we're doing all across the nations is we are declaring to the world, it is time for you to wake up and realize you have an anointing from the Holy One. You have a fire inside of you. You've got a fire in your belly to be released to the nation. Preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. He said, these signs will follow those that will believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly things, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. You know, we have a fast food restaurant in the United States called Burger King, and they have a little theme song. 
Have it your way. Have it your way at Burger King. Have it your way. You can order your burger any way you want it. Let me tell you something. We don't have a have it your way gospel. This is his way or the highway. This is his way. He says, you come into my kingdom. You give your life to me. You lay your life down. Take up your cross and follow me daily. It's not have it your way. You don't get to have it your way and pick out the parts of the Bible that you like and then leave away the other parts. We don't get to change things around when it doesn't suit us or, or when it doesn't feel right. I'm going to tell you, there's some stuff in this book that I don't like. I read the Bible, there's some stuff in there that I don't like. When he says, forgive your enemies, I want to I, I'm telling you, that's a struggle sometimes. When he says, bless those that curse you, bless those that persecute you. When they revile you and persecute you for all kinds of things, say false things about you. He says, you bless them, you forgive them. I don't like having to praise through my pain. I'm being honest. There's sometimes when things are going wrong and, and I, 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 I want to just hide away and have a little pity party. But that never accomplishes anything. You got to praise through your pain. You got to praise till you get your victory. You got to sing when you don't feel like singing. You got to dance when you don't feel like dancing. This is the Bible that we're called to. We need to contend for the faith. Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. I don't know about you, but I've never, I've never gotten into a fight and got beat up and said, that was a good fight. The only fight I ever thought was a good fight was the fight I won. Huh? Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. Why? Because you were made more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. You are a winner, and you can accomplish great and mighty exploits in his name. If we want what they had, we have to pay the price. They tarried. They made sacrifices. They left everything and followed Jesus. Matthew 11 and 12 said, that from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. I'm telling you, we got to take territories. we got to drive the enemy out of our lives. We can't coexist with the devil. You can't, you, can't, you, 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 can't, you can't live in a kingdom where Jesus is Lord of your life and still every day be wrestling with the devil. you got to drive him out of your life and get your focus on the things of God. We have a territory. You have a family. You have a sphere of influence. We have an assignment from the Father, and God has placed you where you are on purpose for a purpose. You were placed where you are on, for a purpose. You are on a purpose for a purpose. In Luke 19, in verse 13, go with me. To, let's read it together. Luke 19, in, thir, in verse 13. So he called 10 of his servants and delivered to them 10 minas. And he said to them, do business till I come. If you read it in the King James Version, it says, occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. Get busy. Get about the Father's business. Realize there's a lost world dying and on their way to hell. And we don't come into these meetings just so we can have a hurrah party and celebrate each other. We're here to assign assignments, give assignments. We are here to learn our mandate. We are here to hear the voice of God and be commissioned to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Ephesians 4, 27 says, give no place to the devil. That word place in the Greek is he, it's topos. Topos, the word topos, give no position of opportunity. Don't coexist with the devil. What the enemy wants is your territory, and you and I have been called to rule and reign with Christ. We're not beggars and paupers. We're sons and daughters. We've been empowered by the word of the Lord. We have his word and we can conquer and take territories. We're called to be kings and priests. In Genesis 22 and verse 17, that in blessing I will bless thee and multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, as the sand upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. We need to possess the land. Those of you that are here in East London, those of you that are here in this town, God's called you to possess the city. God's called you to take territories. Those of you that are watching in cities and countries and providences all around the world, God's called you to bloom right where you've been planted. 
Stop thinking if I get out there, if I could just get there, then if I could just be with them. No, no, no. God puts you right where you're at, and he's called you, and he's ordained you, and he's commissioned you. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Take the territory. Hallelujah. Amen. Listen, the devil realizes you've already given your life to Christ. He's, he's, he's already lost that battle. Now what he's trying to do is to hinder you from stepping into his purpose. To realizing that your purpose is bigger than you. It isn't about you anymore. It isn't about your feelings. It isn't about what you want and what you need. It's all about him. It's all about dying to the cross. It's all about laying our lives down and taking up our cross and following Jesus. Go with me to 1 Kings. Let's look at 1 Kings 21. 1 Kings chapter 21. I love this story in the Bible. It came to pass after these things that Naboth... The Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel next to the place of Ahab, the king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth saying, give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it's near next to my house. For it, I will give you a vineyard better than it. Or if it seems good to you, I will give you its worth in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. That I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. <laughs> he said, look here, I've got a calling on my life. I'm not giving it to you. I'm not selling it to you. It's not for sale. It's my place of intimacy. It's my garden. And I refuse to let you have it. This is what the devil wants. He says, give me your intimacy. Give me your territory. Listen to me. Listen to me. When God brought you into the kingdom of God, he never asked you for your resume. <laughs> he didn't ask you what you were good at. He didn't ask you what you could do for him. He brought you into the kingdom. He found you. You didn't find God. He came looking for you, and he brought you into his kingdom, and he assigns you a purpose. That's just, that's, I, I'm not very good at sharing my faith. I'm, I'm nervous to go out on the streets, and I don't know what to say to people. When you realize it is not your, it's not your purpose, it's his purpose. You didn't get hired to do a job. You were adopted into a royal family. We have a kingdom. We have a territory. We've been given dominion. You were chosen to fulfill a calling. In 1 Peter 2, 9, it says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into light. When the worship happens and, and the team is worshiping, you're not to be a spectator. You're to be a participator. you got to own the territory. When the atmosphere shifts and you can sense the atmosphere shift and the worship goes, you're not to sit in your seats and just watch the worship service. You're to enter into worship. You're to stop, stop letting everything be about you and all be about him. You have to possess the secret place. You have to possess the secret place. That's your territory. You can't go in there with cell phones and iPads and, and, and trying to occupy the world while you're trying to meet with God. You got to shut everything down and you got to go into that secret place. Psalm 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress and my God, and Him will I trust. God wants us to take back our schools. God wants to raise up leaders and, 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 and pe put, put people in places of authority and take back our schools. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, I don't know about you, but uh, for me, I've only been in your town for two days. 
But for me, when I opened the balcony of the hotel and I walked out on that balcony and I looked at the people walking down the street, my heart was so grieved. I sat up on my balcony and wept over the city and said, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, this church is a lighthouse to the city. Your place of intimacy is a lighthouse to your neighbors, to your family, to your friends. You have a call to reach the world for Jesus. We should grieve over the lost. We're not better than anybody. We just, we just, we, we were just found by Jesus. We said yes to Jesus. If it had not been for Jesus, I'm no different than anybody on those streets. We should grieve when no one gets saved. We should grieve when there's no testimony of healing. With this many believers, this many people watching online, there are to be testimonies every day of people getting out of wheelchairs, blinded eyes being opened, deaf people talking, lame walking, devils being cast out. I want you to go with me to Luke chapter 8. Taking the territory. Luke chapter 8 is a very familiar story to most everybody in the room in verse 22. It's about the disciples who, who get caught in a storm. Luke 8 and verse 22. Now it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. That's real important in this text. I've highlighted it, I've underlined it in my Bible. Let us cross to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. A windstorm came on the lake. And they were filling with water. And they were in jeopardy. And they came to him and they woke him saying, Master, Master, we're perishing. Then he arose and he rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. And they ceased. And there was a calm. And he said to them, where's your faith? And they were afraid and they marveled, saying one to another, who can this be? For he commands even the winds and the water, and they obeyed him. I've read this story so many times. It's a Bible story we teach our kids in kids' church. I've been raised in church my whole life, and I've heard this story so many times, but I've never put the story together until recently. The storm isn't the focus of the story. It's preached. Every evangelist preaches about Jesus speaking and calming the water, calming the storm, how Jesus was asleep in the boat. But there's so much more to this story. When you begin to understand this story, you're going to know the heart of God. You understand the power and the, and the purpose of why he came. In Luke 8, 26, then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. My wife and I have been taking trips to Israel, and we were in Galilee. And I said to our guide, where, where is the Gadarenes? And he pointed to me this cliff. And he said, that's the Gadarenes. That's where the swine ran off into the water. And I looked at that place. I said, I want to go there. I want to go there. He said, it's one of the most excavated places right now around Galilee. That all around that place of the Gadarenes, they're finding temples. They're finding synagogues that were, that, were, that were raised up. And so many of them. And he said, it's a, it's, a, it's a mystery. They're trying to understand it. And as, as I was reading this story, God began to speak to me. The storm was what tried to stop them to get from where they were going. Look at verse 27. And when they stepped out onto the land, there met him a certain man from a city who had demons for a long time. He wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but he lived in the tombs. And when, Je when he saw Jesus, he cried out and he fell down before him. And with a loud voice he said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he commanded the unclean spirits to come out of the man. For it had often seized him. And he was kept under guard, with bound, bound with chains and shackles. He broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. 
Jesus said to him, saying, what's your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him that they would not be commanded to go out of him into the abyss. Now the herd of many swine was feeding there on the mountain. And so they begged him that he would permit them to enter them. And he permitted it. And then the demons went out of the man, entered into the swine, and the herd of swine violently, violently ran down, down the steep place into the lake and drowned. And those who fled from them saw what had happened. And they fled and they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what had happened. And came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had departed sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind. <laughs> and they were afraid. They also had seen it and told them by what means this had been done by the demon possessed that was healed. Then the whole multitude in the surrounding region of the gatherings asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear, and he got into a boat and returned. Look at verse 38. Now the man whom the demons had departed begged him that he might go with them. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to your own house and tell the great things that God has done. And he went his way and he proclaimed throughout the whole city what things Jesus had done for him. And therefore they're finding synagogues all over that place where this demon-possessed man began to take his territory. This wasn't about the storm. This is about let's go to the other side. Let's go to the gatherings. Let's go to the Gentiles. They weren't Jewish people, they were raising pigs. They were Gentiles, and Jesus said, this is my father's business. This is what I'm all about. We got to take that territory. You and I got to realize uh, we have not been called into the kingdom of God just to live in a life of lust. Uh, we've been called to the highways and the byways to compel the lost. Come in. Come in. All we see is the storm. All we see is the tormented boy. But Jesus saw. He saw a village. He saw a city. He saw a people that needed to know him. Sometimes you've got to realize when all you're seeing is the pain and all you're seeing is the problem, you have to realize there's an assignment on your life. The boy fell at his feet and called him the son of God. The demons knew who had the power. Jesus had the power to set him free. Jesus had a mission to get to the gatherings. The storm wasn't the first line. The storm was the first line of attack to keep them from what God had called them from. I wonder what line of attack you're under right now. I wonder what kind of oppression the enemy has tried to bring into your life. I wonder what the enemy is telling you. What excuses do you have for the reason that you can't go out and tell people about Jesus? What is the excuse you're giving God that you can't be the one who will be the next revivalist or the next prophetess that will prophesy, thus saith the Lord, repent you generation of vipers, for Jesus has come to set at liberty those that are captive. Hallelujah. to realize you have territory that God wants to possess. You have territory that Jesus wants you to place your feet. Every place that you put your foot, God says, I've given you that land for territory. I've given you the authority to go in there and take the land. The steps of the righteous are ordered by God. Man, that stirs me up. That so excites me that God would bring me for the United States of America and bring me into South Africa to put my feet on this soil and declare Jesus is Lord over East London. Jesus is Lord over Europe. Jesus is Lord over Canada. Jesus is Lord over the world. Ezekiel said it's like a wheel within the middle of a wheel. Jeremiah said it's like fire shut up in my bones. I, I've got a stirring in my spirit to call men and women and young, young ladies and young leaders uh, to call you onto the battleground and say, look, it's time to take the territory. It's time to stop playing games with the devil. You have an anointing.
Jesus came. Jesus came to give us life and to give it more abundantly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know what? Satan had a right to be in that young boy. There were doors opened. <laughs> but we as the body of Christ, we've come in to evict the devil and take away his rights. We're here to tell him there's a new king in town. It's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. There's a new sheriff and he's come in to drive out the enemy. Hallelujah. God has called you. God has appointed you. And God has chosen you. He came looking for you. I don't know, I don't know where he found you, but I know where he found me. I was in a broken place. I was a wounded little church kid that thought he didn't love God anymore, that thought he knew his own plan, and then my plan was better than God's plan. I thought I could give God my life when I wanted to give God my life, but he interrupted me, and he came in. He said, son, today is the day of salvation, and tomorrow is promised to no man. I remember sitting in a seat and gripping that seat as tight as I could. I didn't want to go to that altar but he knocked on my heart's door he said this day the son of man has come to give you life i don't know where he found you but i know where he found me sometimes we get so consumed i'm a pastor sometimes we get so consumed with building a church Man, I'm telling you, Jesus said, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. My life is to, to build people now. My life is to encourage you. You have an anointing from the Holy One. You have a calling on your life. You can't be silent anymore. You can't sit back and let the devil do what he wants to do. Drive him out. Drive him out. Get a yes in your spirit. Say no to the devil. Amen. Amen. That boy wanted to leave and go with Jesus. Jesus said, no, son. What I've done for you is to set you free, and now you go set others free. You go take what I've done in you and go give it away. That's your assignment. That's your calling. What's my calling? It's to lead people to Jesus. If a vision doesn't cost you everything, it's just a daydream. If a vision doesn't cost you everything, it's just a daydream. If a man hasn't discovered, Martin Luther King said this, if a man hasn't discovered something he would die for, he isn't fit to live. You gotta find spiritual purpose. Any city, any city, revival can be secured from heaven when heroic souls decide to enter a conflict, enter a conflict, determined to win or die or sometimes to win and die. I've come in, I said, God, it's not about me anymore. It's not about my blessings. It's not about all the good things that you're doing for me. I've come into the kingdom of God for such a time as this. God raised me from the dead to give me a story to tell, to tell you there's no devil in hell that's stronger, that has more authority than the word of the living God. Amen. I love this harbor back here uh, and seeing all those Mercedes getting on those ships. I love, I love that harbor. And a ship is safe in a harbor, but that's not what ships were made for. They weren't made to sit in harbors. You weren't made to sit in a church service. You weren't made to sit at home and watch television. You were made to get into the city and tell the lost, home time, baby, home time. God's looking for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The church that is going to impact this century is going to be the church whose dreams are bigger than its memories. I've got great memories of all the books I've read about Smith Wigglesworth and Lester Summerall and all the great heroes of our faith, but my dreams are bigger. My eyes see. I've got eyes of hope. I've got eyes for the future. I'm looking at hope and saying, ah, I believe for our end time revival that God's going to bless young prophets. God's going to call young men and he's going to send them to territories and we're going to bring hope to the future we're going to bring hope to our kingdom hallelujah come on shout to god shout to god hallelujah hallelujah
man. How much time? Uh, all right, have a seat. <laughs> he said there's no time limit, so let's go, so let's go deeper. Write some things down, okay? I'm going to give you five truths about your assignment. Your God-given assignment will be a person, not a pulpit. You better get it. Some of you are trying to wait till you get a church, wait till you get a platform. Your God-given assignment is a person, not a pulpit. When we jumped on the airplane to fly here, there was a man sitting by my wife, and I said, baby, I'll sit by the man. She said, no, I want to sit here. That's okay. I said, I can sit in the middle. She said, no, I'm okay. And as soon as she sat in the seat and he sat down, she looked at him and said, are you a man of faith? He began to cry. He was going through so much, he even had a determination in his heart that he was going to attempt suicide. He said, I have even thought in my mind, he's a minister of the gospel that had gotten so depressed because his eyes was on his assignment instead of God's assignment. And Bobby began to tell him, you got purpose, son. You're not done. If you ain't dead, you ain't done. You got an assignment from the Holy One. Amen. Your God-given assignment will be a person, not a pulpit. You are a whosoever. Listen to me. I got news for you. I've preached it wrong my whole life. I said, for, God died for the world. But let me tell you something. The Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever. He didn't die for the world. He died for a whosoever. It's a stranger on the road. It's a guy by the side of the road. It's somebody at your workplace. It's a neighbor down the road. It's somebody. It's a person. And God has called us to reach people. Number two, your assignment will often contain a season of insignificance. Your assignment will often contain a season of insignificance. If you begin to read Hebrews 11, <laughs> I love it in the Message Bible, verse 24, by faith Moses, when he was, re when he was born, refused the privilege of the Egyptian royal house. But he chose a hard life with God's people rather than the opportunistic soft life of sin with the oppressors. He valued suffering in the Messiah's camp far greater than the Egyptian wealth because he was looking ahead, anticipating the payoff. So many times in ministry, you're going to find yourself feeling moments of insignificance you have to continue to remind yourself it isn't about you it's about him it's about his purpose number three i move quickly people will be assigned from hell to delay distract destroy and derail your assignment people will be sent they will be assigned by hell to delay distract Destroy and derail your assignment. As you do your part in this kingdom, you're often going to hear stories about how people stepped into an assignment and everything went perfect. We love those stories where you heard God, you moved on it, and all of a sudden you got results immediately. But I'm telling you, that's not always the story. There are people this, that have been assigned by hell to delay, distract, derail your assignment. And every time you step out in faith, there's an enemy. There's an evil one that wants to discourage you. He wants to get you thinking it's not going to work, and that wasn't successful. But I'm here to tell you the Bible says one plants, one waters, and God gives the increase. you got to step into your assignment. Number four. You will only succeed when your assignment becomes an obsession. <laughs> you will only succeed when your assignment becomes an obsession. When you get obsessed with finding a hurt 
person, a lost person, and bringing them into the kingdom of God. When you get obsessed in your life, I refuse to be normal. I refuse to be average. I have been called into the kingdom for such a time as this, and I will take the territory and drive the devil out. Amen. Don't get distracted. Whatever has the ability to hold your attention has mastered you. Get obsessed with the kingdom of God. The apostle Paul was obsessed with his assignment. In Philippians 3, 13, I do not count myself as apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind me, reaching forward to those things that are ahead, I press towards the goal, the prize, and the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You got to learn to withdraw from re relationships that don't feed your righteous addiction. You got to learn to withdraw from some people that are always telling you what you can't do. You got to get around some people that look you in the eye and say, girl, you can do this. Boy, you can do this. Man, get up out of this room. Get up out of that hospital bed. You can walk. Last one. Your assignment may seem small. Yet from an eternal perspective, it may be the one link in a great chain of events. Your assignment may seem small, yet from an eternal perspective, it may be the one link in a great chain of events. <laughs> Just a kind word. Just a smile in your face, uh, just a word of encouragement, just to be able to stand and say, I know God loves you. I know God has a plan for you. You got to remember, acorns become oak trees. <laughs> Remember the servant girl at Naaman's house who told her mistress that there was a prophet who could cure Naaman's disease. She didn't heal Naaman. She didn't even talk to Naaman. She just said, I know a man that can heal the master's disease. You remember the boy that had the fish and loaves? He didn't multiply him. He just gave what he had. Your contribution may seem small. It may seem insignificant, but it may be the one chain link that will connect the miracle to the miracle worker. It may be the one link in this thing. Your smile at the front door, your greeting in the parking lot, your smile, on the, your voice of happiness on the phone. Zechariah 4.10, for who has, desired, who has despised the day of small things? Nothing is small in the hands of the great multiplier. <sighs> Never doubt. I close with this. Pastor Arnold, I close with this. Never doubt that a small group of people can't change the world. Because in essence, it's the only thing that ever has. It was 12 disciples that heard his call. It was 12 men that gave their lives and laid their lives down. And they carried the gospel to the ends of the earth. And you and I are alive today because they laid their lives down and found purpose in the arms of God. Get up on your feet and give God a shout if you would. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.